good. I hope everyone's having a great time at the networking track. That's more like it. So I guess your food coma for lunch is over and you can actually function and listen to what I have to say. All right, as the uh, talk is advertising, this is not about XDP. Uh, we do have the rest of the kernel to deal with. We have our traditional networking stack, and it needs to be taken care of because we're still using it. It's very important. <laughs> so we're going to talk about two important issues uh, from my perspective, uh, clean and maintainable code and this issue of isolation and network namespaces and stuff like that, which I kind of like piqued my interest in. Uh, it's kind of cool to talk about. So I want to get into a topic which is one of these instances where we push something down the road over and over again. And it's kind of like this snowball that's getting bigger and bigger. And it's harder to stop the more we let it roll down the hill. And this is uh, SKB list handling. Um, I tried a trick many years ago. I tried to propose that we have this issue, and I would hope someone else would jump on the task, and no one has done so. So after many years, I kind of just sat down and started working on it myself. Um, SKB lists, SKBs are maintained on various kinds of data structures. It's not just lists anymore, actually. It, um, but it, the list handling itself is done by hand. We don't use the generic kernel list handling facility. Therefore, we don't benefit from the debugging and other uh, nice aspects of the generic list handler that we've accumulated over time. Uh, it's not even a straightforward implementation of by hand list handling. There's weird semantics like sometimes it's a singly linked list, sometimes it's a doubly linked list with a head, and not being on a list is indicated by a null pointer. Some pieces of code do weird things with the previous pointer to indicate some other piece of state. I mean, it's, it's it's a mess, and it's, it, it, there's no way to figure out how. You can't just look at a piece of code operating on an SKB on a list and figure out which of these semantics it's using. You need to have more context, and it takes a long time to understand. The GRO engine, which takes smaller MTU-sized packets and accumulates them into a GRO superframe, was using a Selenium linked list uh, with the special previous pointer semantics. Then you have the QDIS layer, which has its own use of the SKB list to move the freeing of a bulk queue of packets outside of a lock. This is code that Eric added some time ago. And then if I'm going to try to do this and convert at least some aspect of SKB list handling to the generic list handling, how do I figure out the scope of what I need to do? So, the cool thing to do, I think, is to remove the next and pre pointers from SKB and then try to make some one of the kernel objects in the, in the tree and see what the out GCC output looks like. It's kind of fun. You should do it. <laughs> uh, it would take up less space on the slide than Jesse's slide about all the ETH tool op uh, offload options. But uh, yeah, it would be a Mad Max kind of situation. So. I brought this up again last year, uh, earlier this year in Boston, and Eric Dumaze is like, hey, we have this thing that I've always wanted to convert the GRO engine to hash tables because the list it uses doesn't scale. If you have a lot of parallel flows at the same time coming into the system, we don't accumulate as much as we potentially could, and that's a serious problem. I said, oh, okay, so I'll start stage one, work on the GRO stuff because it's kind of isolated. It's a nice little test case to see how much work is involved in this conversion. So I converted to list head, and I just walked through all the methods and converted everything by hand, and just grudged through it. It turns out that the pre pointer special semantics weren't even necessary. It was a situation that actually could not occur anymore after some changes we'd made a couple years ago, but the person making changes didn't notice this side effect, so I could just get rid of that, and that simplified things a lot. Then I, once we have list head and that's working, converting to hash table was absolutely trivial. Um, then there are some bugs. So once you're done with GRO and you've made the super packet, you pass it up into the networking stack. And now you're living in the domain of SKB list semantics with the by hand stuff had implemented. So all the code you look at after this point forward is going to check is the next pointer null. If it's not, it's on a list. 
So I left the next pointer from the list head on there and things would explode if you hit that code path. So there were a lot of bugs involving uh, making sure that we set the next pointer to null after we finished with the GRO processing. Okay, we did GRO. So let's remove the next improve pointers from SKBuff again and see, boom, right? Um, then you go into skbuff.h and you have all these queue handlers and all these things and then that's where I learned about the package scheduler having its own special set of list semantics. Need a better top level attack plan and that is we have to get to a situation where accesses to the next improved pointers of the skb go through some kind of helper. So this means we have many families of helpers. There are set of helpers for that we can convert to list head where we're using a, a doubly linked traditional linked list. We have another set for people who want to use a singly linked list, maybe even a separate situation set of helpers for the case where we're doing SKB frag lists, which are another case of a singly linked list, but have their own set of semantics. Um, going through this whole process through the tree, the core and the protocols were pretty clean. Like most people use the interfaces. Some situations we were forced upon this. So for example, when Eric Dumaze added RB, RB, RB trees for uh, TCP uh, retransmit uh, queue maintenance, you were forced to put everything behind the proper abstraction so that he could replace them with the RB tree equivalent. So that helped a lot. Um, and then when we want to go to list head, if we have all these we put everything behind the proper interfaces, it's just a matter of changing the engine that's underneath and then we're using list heads all of a sudden and nobody notices. Uh, I've made a lot of progress in this area. Um, the really tripping points for me and the time consuming ones were wireless drivers that are doing funny stuff. <laughs> the wireless driver gets a packet and it has certain fragments and a certain layout in scatter gather list. And then the device has some limitations. It's, you have to align all the buffers on this many bytes and you can only have this many bytes in the segment and so it has to convert A to B. And so it takes a, a list of SKBs from coming from the original packet and a destination that it's gonna use to, to, to rearrange the buffers for the DMA limitations and it's just ugly code and a lot of by hand list handling. I change it and then I'm like, well, who uses this device anymore? Who can test it? And you can just imagine how this process goes. I thought I was in the clear, but then I started looking at how the SCTB chunk handling and event uh, packet uh, creation works, and that's a hellish mess as well. Yeah, I, I, I don't even have to ask who said sorry. I know who said it. <laughs> But I will say in passing that that person who said sorry is helping me review the, uh, the changes I'm trying to make, so it's uh, helping me a lot. Um, but it's another situation where it was so much easier to just assume that the implementation of the list head was this way, and then we could mess with the pointers directly and s save some effort. We'll get through that. And then I have this patch rating in the ring. I'm just so scared to apply it and actually test it that just flips the switch for SKBQs and goes to list head. So that should be really exciting. Boom. Uh, so at this last stage where I'm trying to find the stragglers that are going to trip us up, it's like not easy to find. But there is a distinct signature for these bozos who are directly accessing the next and pre pointer. And it's this either a, a cast to SK buff pointer or a cast to an SK buff head. If you see this, run for the hills. <laughs> like this is beyond danger, this is toxic, this is nuclear, get your asbestos suit on. But this is the kind of code I'm gonna have, I have to fix up at this point. Uh, there were some in SCTP. Because <laughs> the point is, with our existing by hand list handling, the next pointer points to the beginning of the structure, be it an SK buff head or an SK buff. Whereas with the list head, that assumption no longer necessarily holds because it's just ringing around to the different list, uh, li list node entries. So that's just going to explode this uh, pointer arithmetic crap. Uh, so once we get past SCTP and any other things my, fan my funny grep finds will be ready to apply to conversion. This brings me to my next topic, resource sharing across network namespaces. This is cool. So we have a bunch of tables in the kernel and 
Some of them are controlled by external entities in one way or another. So for example, the best example in my is the neighbor table or the ARB table, the ARB resolution table. Someone tries to communicate with us, we make an ARP entry, and the table grows based upon how many entries we need to have. There's a global limit, and we start garbage collecting once we hit, get past that limit. However, that limit is global, which means that if you've got 100 namespaces, one of your dudes can take up most of that limit to the detriment of every other namespace on your system. So. What do we do? Do we continue, we try to make the global model work somehow? Do we go to segregated tables and some per NS level stuff? So some other tables in the tree that have this kind of issue, there's socket hashes, there's routing tables and caches, there's fragment queues, there's network device lists, all this other stuff. So the global, the global table with the namespace key is the simplest to implement and it's the cheapest. Uh, you don't have to allocate a table when you create a namespace. You don't have to delete and free a table when you delete a namespace. And you also don't have to RCU synchronize with asynchronous accesses to that table when you destroy the namespace. So people became very sensitive over the past couple of years to net namespace creation and destruction costs. So the, uh, a lot of the thinking in this area is driven by those considerations. Um, but when you do a simple global table, it means that one of the keys you have to compare in the hash lookup is the namespace key. Uh, so this works as a first approximation, but uh, like I said in the pre during the previous slide, it lacks the object pressure isolation. So one guy can hurt the whole set of instances and you're globally on your system. Now, you do per NS tables, this, mean, this is more work. You've got to allocate it, you've got to free it, you've got to synchronize when you destroy. The NS is a key is implicit, so it makes lookups faster. You have less keys to compare, and you don't have to store that NS key in the key in the object itself because the key is implicit. Um, limits and sizing now become an issue. So it's easy to say, okay, if I have this much memory in my machine, I'll set the ARP limits to X, Y, and Z. What does this mean when I create? 40 namespaces. What does this mean when I create a thousand namespaces? What kind of numbers can we can we choose? Can we even enforce by default on the namespace basis? Like if you have a setup that's working now and every once in a while one of the guys goes over what you would use as this per namespace limit, they may not function properly anymore. So we could break things by going to per NS limits. Um, so like I said, they're hard. What's, what's the metric? Can we do it by default? Probably not. Global limits satisfy system level constraints, but they have this weakness that I discussed earlier. So maybe we need a combination of both. Uh, we have this unbounded situation if we go with a per NS limit. You're kind of saying like, if each NS gets X and we have a thousand namespaces, this means X times a thousand could be potentially consumed by all the namespaces. So you have quickly have a combinatorial explosion problem with the resources that you're allowing various entities to use, and that's no good. Like we keep saying, the global limit has a path for ab abuse, but it puts a really solid cap on what could be used globally on the system and allocated that way. So maybe availability-based policies, so kind of like packet shaping, you may say, you know what, I guarantee you at least 20 megabit, but if no one else is using the network, you can go ahead and use all the resources that are available. So that's one kind of model we could be thinking of. Uh, so kind of squeeze people back to their limits when there is actual across the board usage that's fairly consistent, but if an otherwise quiet system, your one namespace could use all the resources it could. Uh, it means that we need a, to do remote trimming. So I'm the guy who's not really abusing your resources and I all of a sudden need to use something and we need to pin you down, we have to go remotely into another namespace and take away some of their ARP entries and that could be a little bit complicated. Um, the implicit assumption in this suggestion is that everything in these tables can be reconstituted some way in the future. So that's, uh, if you remember the routing cache we used to have, we always had the routing table sitting behind it. So if we needed to remake a routing cache entry in the future, we always could construct a new one. The ARP table is like that too. Uh, so these are situations where we can use this, situ this kind of approach. Now, 
you know what, I control every aspect of this deployment. I know what's going to run on all these namespaces. I trust the namespaces. Just let them go up to the global limit. It's fine. They're going to do everything like that. But you, if you're in this situation, you have to make sure that you also trust the network that you're putting this, you're deploying this thing on, because anyone can pop you with uh, traffic and uh, trigger these problems, these situations that we're considering. So all these things need to be considered and uh, what we decide to do in the end. So it seems like, in my opinion, no single policy satisfies all these use cases. Uh, so we have a set of solutions we could apply to the reconstitutable tables, and then we have non-reconstitutable tables which may need other solutions. Uh, Let's assume that you agree with me and we need multiple policies for these situations, like how do, we, how do we provide this choice and what do we do by default, and there needs to be some discussion in there. But we definitely, we have an issue and we have to address it somehow. And uh, I'm really happy that people like uh, David A. Hearn have been uh, trying to uh, invoke discussion on this issue. Um, so those are my thoughts on the matter. Um, does anyone have any questions or strong opinions on namespace resource limits? Hurt just like last time. Um, you talked about the global table where you had a namespace key. Yes. And while it took longer because you had to compare the namespace key in order to find it in the global table, would a, a interim solution be have the global table with per namespace accounting so that each namespace would be able to push from the global table? Yeah, that's one way to do it. And, but it, it seems like it kind of multiplies the amount of state you need to maintain. So um, I would have to look more deeply into approaching things like that and seeing what the data structures would look at. That's an interesting idea. Uh, thoughts around um, how C group memory accounting impacts all of this. Huh, that's interesting. So you could put a bunch of names, theoretically put a bunch of namespaces into a C group and then say these guys can use this much resources or things like that. So this kind of is parallel to the discussion of if the administrator knows what he's doing and he can set up all these limits ahead of time, he doesn't need our help. We're talking about what happens by default if you just spin namespaces up and you get the behavior that you've expected in the past. So the, the one set of problems is dealing with the default situation. Another set of problems is how, what kind of mechanism like C groups could we use to formalize this kind of configuration and setting up these limits. That's a good point. Steven. Go, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, have you opened the channel discussion with the actual major users of the C group kind of world be or the container world because my impression is that their needs are not always as general as we might think they are and they also tend to have a lot of static configuration like the open you know uh, open stack etc and you know they're doing things like hard coding FTB entries in for the containers and I'm wondering if, you know, whatever we do, it should be easy to integrate with that rather than, you know, make it life harder and have them to do a whole lot more scripting or some other. I, I, I totally uh, agree with you. I haven't had any discussions with people who are setting up these things, but uh, I think the first thing to do is to understand what the scope of the problem is and uh, like what, what, what do we have on our hands right now because Clearly, allowing one namespace to pop everyone else's uh, ARP tables, it does, we, that can't continue. Uh, then we need to d discuss with people how they actually use and configure this stuff and see if we can have a solution that actually matches their use of this stuff. Uh, so that's, that's definitely the case. We have to communicate with people, figure out what they're doing. All oh, you guys are easy. Thank you very much. Yeah.